Well, as we get to the end of this book, uh, we noted that we've gone from the doctrinal to the practical. Uh, we've gone from belief to behavior the author is focusing on at this time. And so last week, we talked about hospitality. And this week, I said we're going to focus on marriage. So let's do that. Let's uh, look at the first verse. Uh, it's just one verse that we're going to read, actually. So if uh, you are able, could you stand as we read God's word? Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4. Listen to the word of God. Let marriage be held in honor among all, and let the marriage bed be undefiled, for God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. This is God's word. When my wife and I do premarital counseling, we use a tool called Symbus called Save Your Marriage Before It Starts. That's a, that's a, that's a good title, isn't it? And there's one tool on here that I want to show you that we use, and it has to do with marriage mindset. And marriage mindset is just as you enter into this relationship, you're thinking about where, where do I fit on the spectrum of what I'm thinking and feeling about marriage. And so there's the spectrum of the reluctant mindset, the restless mindset, the romantic, the rational, and the resolute mindset. And you'll come up on that chart on, on one part or the other, that spectrum, based on these questions uh, that you answered. And I thought about that idea of mindset and where we are or where people are when they think about marriage, where are they on that spectrum of the mindset? And what I like about this verse is that Hebrews 13, 4, it says God has a mindset. God has a mindset about marriage. And it's an important mindset that we need to listen to. He says, let marriage be held in honor among all and let the marriage bed be undefiled for God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. And when I step back from that text, I, I think it's really, it's talking about two things. It's talking about the source of marriage, uh, the source including the author of marriage, and it's also talking about the sacredness of marriage. And so I want to look at that this morning. I want to look at the source of marriage, and then I want to look at the sacredness of marriage. So the source of marriage in 4a says, let marriage be held in honor among all. So the question is to be held in honor. What does that mean to hold in honor? Well, it means to treat as precious. To hold in honor means to, to treat as a great price, to treat something as if, as if it's costly. It means to, tr to treat with high respect, to honor. It means to highly esteem something. And so it says, hold it in honor, the Bible's saying. It's saying, esteem it, respect it, honor it, this, this thing called marriage. Because marriage is so, so precious to God. Now, that's important. But we really need to define marriage. And in order to define marriage, we need to talk about the source of marriage, understanding the source. And so that's where we're going to begin, the source of marriage. And really, it's quite simple. The source of marriage is God. The source of marriage is God. Its origins are divine and not human. Its origins are theological and not anthropological, although culture has been involved in shaping marriage and even distorting marriage throughout history. But there's a very important verse in the Bible that, help us, that helps us understand the source of marriage. And it's quoted by Jesus in Matthew 19. It's quoted by the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians and also in Ephesians chapter 5. And here's what it says in Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. It says, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and be united with his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And so the source of marriage right here, we see that it's God. It's God's inspired word in Genesis that's giving us this instruction. And marriage is God's divine design that he's given to us. And this verse describes this source of marriage. He made a man and a woman in Genesis 2.24. 
And we see that the institution of marriage is created by God in Genesis 2.24. And the verse, as we look at it, we can see that it gives this description. And then in this description also gives us a definition. So we ask the question, well, what exactly is marriage? And there are a couple of things that this text helps us with understanding what marriage is. And here's what they are. And I've listed them. There's a leaving there's a cleaving, and there's a unity involved in marriage. There's a leaving, there's a cleaving, and there's a unity. So it's leaving. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother. There's a cleaving and be united with his wife. And there's a unity, should be unity at the bottom. The two shall become one flesh. My typo, sorry. And if you kind of summarize what those are saying, you could put it like this. Leaving is about what? It's about a priority. Cleaving is about what? It's about permanence in that relationship. And unity, what's unity about? It's about a oneness that takes place between a man and a woman. So if I were going to kind of just summarize a definition of marriage and how it fits into this text in Hebrews 13.4, I would say it looks like this. Marriage is a sacred covenant between a man and a woman and a woman that involves leaving and cleaving and oneness, which must be protected. It must be protected. Marriage is a sacred covenant between a man and a woman that involves leaving and cleaving and oneness, which must be protected. And that's what Hebrews 13.4 is saying to honor. It's saying honor that. That's what we're supposed to honor. Let marriage be held in honor among all. Now, let's keep going with this definition a little bit because I want to flesh it out a little bit more, but not too much because you could, you could spend a whole sermon on this, but we're just in the first part of that verse. So I said that leaving is about priority. And what that means is there is a priority in the relationship between the man and the woman. Because when it says a man shall leave his father and mother, it's saying there is a leaving that must take place. And that word for leaving is a very strong word. It means to leave behind. It means to depart from. It, it can mean even to forsake. And so you have somebody who's grown up all their lives through childhood and through young adult. And the most important relationship in their lives have been that relationship between the child and the parents, the most fundamental and important relationship. And it's saying now that that needs to be left. And it needs to be left because here's why. Because when you get married, the most important relationship in your life must now be your spouse. That has to be the most important relationship. There has to be a priority centered around that relationship. Nobody else in your life, no other relationship should have a higher priority than the priority between the husband and the wife, the spouse. I mean, that relationship takes priority over your job. It takes, it takes priority over your hobbies, even over your children, because the most important relationship from that point on forward must be your spouse. So there's a leaving, which is a priority that encompasses this idea of marriage. But also in marriage, there's a cleaving that takes place. And cleaving is talking about a permanence in that relationship. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. Now, the word translated there united or to be joined, it, it literally means to be glued to. Uh, it means it's like cement. It's like taking cement and, and sticking two bricks together and they're permanent. It's a permanent bond that takes place to be united in a permanent bond. And that's the idea of marriage. Marriage is a uniting of a man and a woman in a permanent lifelong covenant, a permanent lifelong covenant. Now, I've just introduced a new word there, and the word is covenant. 
Now, what is a covenant? Well, a covenant is interesting, but let me give you a short definition that's helped me to think about marriage. And a covenant is this. It's a legal, public, and permanent relationship. It's a legal, public, and permanent relationship. Because marriage is a covenant, and a covenant is also a promise. Now, there'll be couples that come up to me sometimes, and they'll ask me about marriage and about getting marriage. And um, one of the things that we have to talk about is, well, exactly what is, when are you married? What constitutes being married? I mean, is it just going out in the woods and just, you know, kind of, I don't know, holding hands and pray together, and then poof, you're married? Well, no. Uh, it really involves those three things, that it has to be something that's legal. There has to be, in, the, in Hungary, there's a, there's a legal process that's recognized by the government to be considered married. Uh, it's public. It's where you're coming before people and, and making these, these uh, vows, this covenant vow before God, before people, and before one another. And then it's permanent. It's a lifelong relationship. Now, G.K. Chesterton, he talked about this idea of covenant, and that covenant is a promise. Covenant is a promise. And here's what he said about that promise in marriage. He said, the person who makes a vow makes an appointment with himself at some distant time or place. And so what you're really saying is when you come together in a covenant relationship, you're saying, you know what? Five years from now, I'm going to put it on my calendar, and I'm going to be here with you, this person that I'm making a covenant with. Ten years from now, I'm going to be here. I'm going to be with you. Twenty, thirty years from now, I'm going to make it a point that I'm going to be here with you because it's a promise that you make. So cleaving that takes place is permanent. It's a permanence. And then finally, the last thing about this definition of marriage is that there's, there's this unity that takes place. Uh, the two shall become one flesh. Uh, there's a oneness. And yes, it's, it's talking about that intimate sexual relationship between a husband and wife, yes, but it's also talking about the fact that that person that you're marrying, that person has to be your best friend. There has to be a deep development of a friendship in that relationship, a friendship that's vulnerable to become naked socially and economically with that person. There's this soul oneness that takes place between the husband and the wife. And it means there is something beautiful that's going to come out of that marriage that could not have come out of that marriage if the two people just remained separate. Uh, it's like two chemicals that come together and make a chemical that's different than was before. Uh, it's something that's, that's beautiful in the area of unity and oneness. And so you have the leaving, the cleaving, and the unity. You have this idea of priority, permanence, and oneness. And those together make up this definition of what marriage is. And that's our first point, the point of the source. Let marriage be held in high honor among you. And that's the picture of marriage that's to be held in high honor among you. Marriage is a sacred covenant between a man and a woman that involves leaving, cleaving oneness, which must be protected. And that must be protected gets us to the second part of this verse, 4b. And our second point, which is the sacredness of marriage. So the author says, let the marriage bed be undefiled, for God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. Now, I like the way the message reads in that. And I'll read it for you. And it says this. It says, honor marriage and guard the sacredness of sexual intimacy between wife and husband, God draws a firm line against casual and illicit sex. And I like that translation. Because the Bible is saying that there's this sacred sacredness to the sexual intimacy between a husband 
and a wife, and that must be guarded. It must be guarded. It must remain pure, he's saying. It must remain undefiled. And it specifies what you're guarding it against. And there's two words that are used here. Um, one is sexual immorality and the other is adultery. Sexual immorality and adultery. Now, sexual immorality comes from the word pornos or porneo. And if you think about that, that's where we develop that word pornography. It's illicit sex. It's sexual immorality. So it means sexual intimacy when not being married. That's the bottom line of that. It's sexual intimacy not being married. And the other one, adultery, well, that means sexual intimacy of a married person with someone who's not their spouse. That's adultery. And those are the things that the author is warning against. And it's warning against because this passage represents both a provision and a protection to the couple and the marriage and the vows that they've made to one another. It's protecting the sexual side of human beings. And it's so important that that be protected. Because the mentality of the day and the mentality of today is that sex is just, it's just an appetite. Oh, it's just an appetite. It's an appetite that absolutely needs to be acted upon. And if you peer into our culture and you get a feel for how they view that, well, you can do that by going on Facebook, TikTok, YouTube. And you'll quickly find that sex is viewed as an appetite that must be gratified at a whim with anybody. And some have said that sex is just like drinking water. It's just, it's just an appetite. It's just like drinking water. And to that, I heard a response when that said, well, you know, I've never heard of anybody getting pregnant drinking from a, a drinking fountain of water, you know? So I think it's a little more than just like drinking water. And it is. Now, in verse 4, it's saying, guard the sacredness of sexual intimacy. And there's kind of two kind of sides to this idea of sexual intimacy. There's the uh, sex is just, it's an appetite that needs to be pleased. Or it's sex is just this taboo and we don't talk about it. And, you know, it's something that's kind of dirty. Um, but when you come to the Bible and how it addresses sex, it addresses it as something beautiful. It addresses it as something wonderful. And you can, you can go to the song of, of um, Solomon and find it there. But if you go through Proverbs, it's fascinating when reading through Proverbs to see the references to the idea of this marital covenant and the beauty of the marital covenant. Now, I picked out a verse from Proverbs 30 that I want to talk about a little bit. And it talks about the wonder of the relationship between a man and a woman, the sexual relationship between a man and a woman. And it starts out with this, um, three things are too wonderful for me, for I do not understand. And it's, it's just trying to, it's a, it's a literary technique that is trying to kind of show the wonder of these things. And each one of these things is really subtly, it, it's really subtly, having to do with the relationship between a man and a woman. It's having to do with sex. And so it says in verse 18, three things are too wonderful for me, for I do not understand the way of an eagle in the sky. And the imagery is of that eagle who's riding something, riding in the sky, and the way of a serpent on a rock, and the way of a ship on the high sea. And then finally, it gets to that part where it says, and the way of a man with a virgin. And that's talking about the intimate relationship between a man and a woman. And it's saying, isn't this amazing? Isn't this wonderful? Look what God created. This is something beautiful. It's something fantastic. And it was made for a man and a woman in a covenant relationship. Now, what's interesting is if you go to verse 20, there's a contrast that the author makes, Solomon. And this is the contrast that I call the modern day view of sex as an appetite, and it goes like this. This is the way of an adulteress. She eats and wipes her mouth and says, 
I have done no wrong. And do you see how kind of crass that is? There's something that's kind of just kind of um, plain and, and normal. Eats and wipes her mouth and says, I have done no wrong. Take to eat something so special, something that just above that has been talked about as something magnificent, wonderful, something too great, not just three, but four of these things. And yet here, it gives this image of sex as just appetite. I eat and I wipe my mouth and I go on to the next thing. I've done no wrong. Now, there was an article that I came across a number of years ago that just read this article, my mind immediately went to this. And it was written up in the Daily Mail, the UK Daily Mail, and it was about a woman who was a mistress to many different businessmen, high-powered, uh, uh, very wealthy businessmen. And it's this whole article interviewing her about how normal this is for her to go on these trips with these businessmen and provide for them sexual favors. And she said, as the, I mean, these are married men, uh, they have a wife and kids back home, and she says, I'm actually doing them a favor. I'm actually helping their marriage because I'm providing this for the husband that he's not getting at home all the time. And you talk about deceptive, you talk about something, you know, the lie of Satan who enters in and Totally, totally upfront honest, this woman was. And people are reading that. I don't know what people are thinking, but if they don't have the mindset of God's design for marriage, maybe they think, maybe they think that's a good thing too. And I just thought of this woman. This is the way of an adulteress. She eats and wipes her mouth and says, I have done no wrong. Now, God's view of marriage is different. Yeah, there's, a, there's an appetite that we have uh, uh, in the area of sex, but it's an appetite that's to be controlled by Christ. Now, C.S. Lewis, um, in his screw tape letters, he, he talks about this idea of being united uh, in that last leaving and cleaving and the oneness and, and listen to what he says about the mindset of today. He said, Christ described it, this idea of leaving and cleaving, as one flesh. Now, just for context, the screw tape letters, you've got to understand that this is a senior devil who's instructing some junior devils on how to trip up Christians so that they would uh, just kind of throw out their faith. So you have to read it in that mindset. And so they're speaking, it says, Christ described it as one flesh. Now you can make humans forget that the man they call Paul did not confine it to married couples. Mere copulation, according to Paul, makes one flesh. The truth is, wherever one man lies with a woman, there, whether they like it or not, some kind of transcendental relationship or the potential for it is set up between them which must be eternally enjoyed or eternally endured. This transcendental relationship was intended to produce, and if obediently entered into marriage, will produce affection, permanence, union, and family. The idea is that these, these devils know that a, an obedient and a, a protective covenant marriage will produce affection, permanence, union, and family. And if you have sex with someone to whom you're not married, you know what? It complicates things. It absolutely complicates things. I mean, if you're just, let's say you're both not married, you get sucked into that relationship. You're going to end up staying way too long in that relationship. You can't make rational decisions in that relationship, all because there's this power in your life, and it centers around the physical Sex is a way of say to another person, I belong to you exclusively and permanently to you. That's what it's meant for. And here you are without a covenant relationship to guard that relationship. And when you treat sex like, like drinking a glass of water, you're not living under God's provision and you're not living under God's protection. Because remember the definition of marriage, it's unity, it's one flesh, it's whole person. 
And sex, well, sex is powerful in marriage, but sex is about building community. It's about giving. It's not just about receiving what I want. And if you really step back and think about that whole idea of the intimate sexual relationship between men and women, it's really, it's really renewing your covenant. It's renewing, it's remembering, and it's renewing your covenant that you made before God every time you're having sex. Now, there's a powerful book that I draw on now and then about this idea of appetite, sexual desires, um, and, and our relationship with God. And it's, um, it's Jesus who has this fictional conversation with Oscar Wilde. And Oscar Wilde was someone who was constantly pursuing pleasure. And he wanted to throw out all the rules. He wanted to throw out God's rules for sure. And at one point in the dialogue with Jesus, Wilde responds to Jesus and says this about the appetite. He said, we play with things you want us to treat as sacred, Lord. We run from things you wanted us to cling to. We make companions of those you told us never to embrace. We clutch in our hands what you wanted us to throw away. We throw away what you wanted us to hold fast. And then Jesus responds to Wilde this. He says, and this is so insightful. He says, it is tyranny to have by one means what is designed to be accomplished by another. When you have it the wrong way, you pollute the very longing until the wrong way becomes the only way and the right way becomes a burden. And I really believe that those that are living outside the boundaries of God's provision of covenant relationship and marriage are going to experience this. Because remember the definition of marriage. It's unity. It's one flesh. It's whole person. I mean, sex is about building community. Uh, sex is about giving. Uh, sex is renewing the covenant vows. It's, it's, you live, um, it's if you live outside the boundaries that God has established you to provide and protect, then you're going to pollute the very longing, it says. And that which should be good becomes a burden to you. And it's saying that, that there's a sacredness to marriage. There's a sacredness. Let the marriage bed be undefiled, for God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. And God has laid down these boundaries for us for our good and for our betterment. So marriage is a sacred covenant between a man and a woman that involves leaving and cleaving and oneness, which must be protected, the Bible says. So let's move to application. Let's, let's, let's see how we can make this real for us in our relationships. When I think about marriage, I have to say this. If the point of your marriage is to be married, then you're in trouble. If the point of your marriage is to be married, then you're in trouble. If the point of your marriage is to make you happy, I want to say look out. Look out. Those are people that have been married probably five years or more that are laughing right now. Because happiness is the byproduct of a good marriage. Happiness is a byproduct of a good marriage. See, a covenant relationship that God has designed, it's about what I can give. It's not about what I can get. And I'm telling you, there's so many times that I trip up and I forget that. And I think somehow that my relationship with my wife is about what I can get. And she should be the one providing that for me. Because I forget that love is a verb. Love is a verb, and it's not a feeling. It's not just a feeling, but love is a verb that means action, and it calls us into action. And I love what C.S. Lewis uh, said as he put it this way about this whole idea of being in love and the feelings uh, versus the action. And he said this, but of course, ceasing to be in love need not mean ceasing to love. Love 
is this second sense. Love as distinct from being in love is not merely a feeling. It is a deep unity maintained by the will and deliberately strengthened by habit, reinforced by, in Christian marriages, the grace which both parents ask and receive from God. Because when you get married, you'll find that marriage is going to bring out the worst in you. It is. It's going to bring out the worst in you. It's going to be all your flaws are going to be magnified. And why is that? Because you can't run and hide anymore. You can't leave and, and then go scream in a closet somewhere after that time out together with that other person. It's going to show all your flaws. And before you're married, you could hide or you could just not listen to people who said, Rich, I really think you ought to look at that in your life. But you could, you could just ignore them. But when you're married, you can't run. And when you're married, you can't hide. And you're confronted with your pride and you're confronted with your sin and your selfishness. And I always say in my life, there were like three stages to my selfishness that was, that was exposed when I got married. And the first one was, um, you know, you're single. You can kind of do your own program, do whatever you want. You get married. And it's like there's this other person that has a program and has, you know, things that they want to do as well. And it kind of presses in on your plans. And you're just like, you know what, Rich? You're really a sinner. You're really sinful. Look at the selfishness. Oh, but that's nothing until this first child comes along. You know, four in the morning, the kid's crying, the baby's crying, and your wife's going, hey, it's your turn. You want to get the child? And you're just like, no, I don't, because I'm a sinner. And so it just exposes the cracks in your life. And I think you need to think of it as marriage, as God's fitness gym, you know? There's people right over here across, you know, across the way. You can watch them running on the treadmill, right, Sunday morning getting in shape. Well, you know, marriage is God's fitness gym for you. And he's trying to make you what? He's trying to make you more like Christ. He's trying to make you more like Christ. And you'll hear, you're, you'll hear people say, you know, I'm afraid. I'm afraid I'm going to fall out of love with my spouse. I'm just afraid that might happen. We, when I say you ought to be a lot more afraid of falling out of repentance to your spouse and falling out of love. With your spouse. You know, when our kitchen um, is clean and there's no messes, uh, everything's straightened up, everything's proper, when our kitchen is clean, I know that there's not going to be any of Martha's cinnamon, cinnamon rolls around. There's not going to be any of Martha's Buckeyes around. Um, but when the kitchen is messy and the sink is full of dishes, Oh, it means that there's going to be something really good being made. And I think I have a picture of it somewhere because you got to see how good this is. Oh, yeah. And I liken that to marriage because marriage is messy. But when marriage is messy, that means God's in the business of creating something good that's going to come out of that. And you may not see it at first when marriage is messy and it seems hard and you're being exposed for all your sin. You may not believe it at first. But if you want to taste the deeper, richer part of marriage, if you want the deeper life of marriage, the ingredients of marriage, then you have to know that it's going to be messy. It's going to be messy and it's going to hurt. And you're going to step on each other. But you know what you're going to do? You're going to repent. You're going to trust on Christ. And you're going to move forward in love by faith and not by feelings toward that other person. Because your role is to minister to that person, not to merely manipulate them for what you want. And boy, I had to learn this. You know, I'm, I don't know how many years I'm in a marriage and I'm realizing, you know what? I'm doing a lot of manipulation in my marriage. And I should be a lot, doing a lot more ministering in my marriage than ma manipulating to my wife. And I had, to, I had to sit down and I have to repent to her and say, I'm so sorry for this pattern that I see in my life about manipulating you, whether it's how you parent the kids or, or how you clean the house or this or that. Because my role is to minister and not to manipulate. And marriage is messy, but God is using the other person in your life to refine you, to shape you, to mold you more like Christ. And Paul talks about this 
Christ is refining us and he's washing us and he's making us radiant in Ephesians chapter 5. So, let me just give you a final application and then we're, we're going to go to the gospel and pray. And it's this. When marriage gets messy, I want you to remember four phrases that you can pull up out of sincerity in your marriage. And I'm telling you, I use them a lot. And here's what they are. Yeah, you see them. I am sorry. I was wrong. Please forgive me. I love you. I am sorry. And sometimes you have to swallow your pride when you say that. I am sorry. I was wrong. Please forgive me. I love you. Because the Bible is saying, let marriage be held in honor among all, and let the marriage bed be undefiled, for God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. Now, final thought, the gospel. How does this all relate to Christ and, and the gospel and our relationship with God? Well, let me give you two things real quick. First is we talked about the priority, and then I want to talk about love initiates. So the priority do you know what? Christ made you his priority. Christ made you his priority. How did he do that? He died for you. And we need to make our spouses a priority. And how do we do that? We died a self for them. We sacrificed for them. You see, marriage teaches us something about the gospel, and the gospel teaches us something about marriage. And the other thing is love initiates. Christ moved toward us while when? While we were yet still enemies. And you know, there can be times where you're looking across the table at your spouse and you're thinking, you're the enemy. And when you think that, it's from the devil. Because you need to be fighting back to back and not face to face. You need to be fighting with your backs toward one another as a couple in harmony because Satan is out to destroy your marriage. Love initiates and your spouse um, may feel like the enemy, but you need to fight in unity as a couple together. Priority and love initiates. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you've given us these, this picture of marriage and the importance of the intimacy in marriage for our protection and our provision and we thank you for Christ who made us a priority and came down from heaven and died on a cross for us. Initiating that love while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Spirit, we ask and pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.